we're going to start this with a, a, a different spin today. Last week, we took a look at 21 verses. Actually, if you take them all in, it's 22 passages that say the love of God reaches everybody, that Christ died for every person's sins, that the blood of Christ will bless all people, all nations, all places. Today, we're only going to use a few scriptures, and those will be at the very end, because we need to talk about, well, if the Bible talks about all this love, 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 was, did it leak out somewhere? <laughs> Because a lot of the sermons we've heard in our life are, are not love-based. They've been very hell-based or you know, repenting-based. All of which things are important. And those, those sermons are coming. But for now, let's start with what, what happened between the early church and us. One of my favorite shows is a show that's been off the air now for more than a decade called Mythbusters. It was a very popular show in America, one of the most popular, in fact. It took popular ideas, sayings, stories, and then put them to the test to see if they were true or not. And they could be very little things, such as, if it's raining, do you get wetter if you just walk or if you run? Or it could be bigger things on how do you raise a ship that has been sunk. And it was fun, it was a bit comedic, but it was also science. For years, we've been doing the same thing on Monday by saying, who told you this? Let's put it to the test. On Mythbusters, they would come up with busted or confirmed or possible. And we've done a lot of that here. We do that because we go look at the scripture, try to put it into context, see what it meant to them, what it meant to the hearer, to the writer, in the culture. And there are times that because of this, that we'll be looked upon and people will say, well, you're just trying to kowtow to the current culture. You're just trying to be too progressive or maybe you're afraid of being attacked by the culture. Let me just say it as bluntly as I can. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. There's something about the Mead family doesn't have the fear gene. And I feel like if God is God, and I truly believe he is, and if he is who the Bible says he is, and I believe that he is, then he's big enough to handle any of our questions and investigations, and that he will reveal to us what we need to know, even on these sticky subjects. About two years ago, I did a six-part series on Monday morning, Who Told You About Hell? It got thousands and thousands of views, and it's still racking up views to this day. I long ago lost count of all the emails, calls, conversations, thanking me for this series. Although there were all the, those others that were angry because people want their hell. They want it there for other people. And whenever you start talking about what the Bible talks about and what it means when it talks about hell, it bothers people. We're going to actually go and look at every passage in the next few weeks, not starting today, but the next few weeks, Every passage that talks about any of the words translated hell, or punishment, or death, or the grave. And we're going to look at them in context. So, hang in there for the moment. It was still important, obviously, for all the views we've had there. And <clears throat> the number of shares have just been incredible. It's important for us to realize that Christianity has a hell problem. As we've seen in the last week, many passages plainly state that it is God's plan to save all people everywhere from every culture, every kindred and tribe. So what about the passages mentioning hell and destruction? Is, is what we have been taught, here's the question for today, is what we have been taught about those passages, what was always taught, or is that a myth that needs to be busted? is what we have been taught the old original teaching of the church or have we not been lied to because I believe people do these things out of good conscience are we wrong do we need to look at what the early church says well I always think you need to take a look at what the early church said the teaching that most of us have grown up with just to review goes something like this God created the world and then sin entered into it 
Now we're all sinners, and our only chance of salvation is Jesus. At this point, I think we can all say we are agreed, and emphatically so. But then different churches have different extensions to our story. Generally, it goes something like this. Once you have Jesus, you truly only have Jesus if you worship correctly, understand and agree to the core doctrines that our church has taught and presented and gathered and determined are necessary, and you stay in fellowship with our church. If you do not do those other things, then you will never have Jesus in reality, or if you've never come to Christ, you'll go to hell where you will burn for eternity without end. Now imagine yourself a person who's never heard the name of Jesus, much less the gospel. Then a missionary comes and tells you about a God of love that loved you so much. He sent his son to die for your sins. And here's the thing. Even people who have never heard of Jesus or any other particular Messiah teacher that other religions have posited know that they have done wrong in their life. We, we know this. We, if we're honest with ourselves, we know we've made mistakes. We know we've done some of those mistakes on purpose. So it wasn't an accidental mistake. It was an intentional mistake. We know we've fallen short. And so to hear that there's this God of love who has covered our sins with the grace of Christ and the blood of Christ, and now we are saved through him, this is incredibly good news. All good so far. Then the missionary warns you that if you don't listen to what they say, this God of love will then send you to a torture pit where you will burn for billions and billions of years and forevermore. Do you see why this has stopped mission activity in many places? It has also stopped a lot of conversations Christians have had in their schools, around their dinner tables, at work or at school or online. How can a God of love who defines himself as the embodiment of love, send 90 whatever percent of the people he has made in his image and after his likeness to a torture pit when he says he's their father who loves them more than any father could ever love their child. Do you remember that one? Jesus said that we who love our children, God loves his children better and more than we ever could. I find that hard to imagine. I do not find it hard to believe because I believe what Jesus says. But I love my children so much, the thought of God loving us far more than I love them is a bit staggering. And then where do we put in hell? Sometimes people will even say it's just even people who have never heard of the name of Jesus well, hard luck. If you're a Calvinist or part of the Reformed Christian tradition, you will say, well, they just weren't chosen for salvation. Really? Really? A man has, let's say, 10 kids, and he only chooses two of them to be loved? What kind of father would we call that man? And yet God calls himself love. And by the way, when people come up to me and they'll say, you're questioning God and his character. No, I'm saying he told us his character. Are we besmirching it? Are we denigrating our God? We need to understand what he has said to us. By the way, some have said, well, those who have never heard of Christ on earth, they'll get a chance after death to be saved. But those who have heard and rejected him, or, and here's a bigger thing, heard but didn't get the Bible right, they didn't get the worship rules right, or the organization right, or the name of the church right, or the like, those will be lost. Does that make any sense? Think about what you've just said. Let us posit a, an island. There are 100 people on the island. We're going to do round numbers today, because you didn't come here for math. 100 people on the island. They've never heard the name of Jesus. What is the worst possible thing you could do to those people? If you believe what those people we just said have said, worst possible thing would be to bring up the name of Jesus. Because right now you're saying they're saved because they've never heard, they're in ignorance. But you start talking about him, all hundred aren't going to accept him. So by your teaching 
you have condemned a certain percentage of them to a torture pit. This makes no sense. It kills evangelism. So we got to trace the river of our teaching to its source and see if it looks the same there as here or if we've muddied the water. And like I said, we're going to look at every passage that mentions punishment, hell, destruction. We're going to examine all of that, but not today. By the way, if you're thinking, just how long is this series? It's not that long or difficult. The Bible doesn't talk about hell nearly as often as you think it does. In fact, Paul and the epistles of John don't mention it. Check it out. I've said that before, and people start furiously turning, and I, I, I can wait. I got time. Not a lot of time. I'm getting old, but go for it. Have a look. There are three views of hell. Four, if you take the view, there is no hell. Here are the three views. The traditional view, and I say traditional with quotation marks around it, because traditional isn't as old as you might think, is that after death, all hope is lost. After death, there is no other chance. The burning, the pain then lasts forever. Second, that those who don't belong to Jesus will be annihilated, uh, cease to be. They, they will cease to exist entirely uh, as eternal life is a gift from God and they don't receive the gift, it's over. Third, that God eventually saves all. You need to understand something if you've not heard about God eventually saving all. That does not mean that everybody gets just a golden pass at, the, at death saying, well, it doesn't matter, come on in. The Bible does speak of refining reforming, even punishment as through the flames. So universal reconciliation or universal salvation does not mean you get away with everything. It might surprise you to hear that if you go back to the early centuries of the church, the predominant view of the teachers of the church was that everyone would be saved eventually. Universal reconciliation. Now, there was not, I do not want to uh, leave the impression, there was not unanimity. The early centuries of the church had great variety in what they believed. It was not until the Romans came and, and enforced conformity upon the church, then that took a couple centuries to do, that all of these were shoved in to get in line. Before then, there were six major centers of Christianity. Four of them, Alexandria, Caesarea, Antioch, and Eastern Syria, taught universal reconciliation. One of them, Asia Minor, or Turkey, Armenia, in that area, taught annihilation of the wicked. Only one, Northern Africa, taught the doctrine of endless punishment for eternity. And there, where did, you know, where did Northern Africa get that idea? We've met these names before. Tertullian, remember what he said about women, and Augustine, and what he said about women. Why did they get the, um, the predominant view over time? That's a complicated question that we will look at a bit, but if you want to know about how, what the struggle of this light was like between Northern Africa and the other Christian centers, there is a wonderful book called When Jesus Became God. It's a wonderful book, but it's going to really scramble your brain for a while. Not because it's hard to read, but because you will see what Christians did to each other when government got involved. When Jesus Became God, it's by Richard Rubenstein. Um, very much worth, and if you have Kindle Unlimited on your Kindle, you can get it for free. But it's going to mess you up, so I'm just telling you, all right? Many Christians don't know the names of the early church fathers. That's all right. You don't need to know them to get to heaven. But you might know some of them, like Origen, the first Christian leader to write down a complete, systematic theology for the faith. He lived and worked around 200 AD. He taught universal reconciliation. Or the great saint of the Eastern Church, um, there are so many, but... He was called the father of fathers of Christianity there. Gregory of Nyssa. And you've heard of Clement of Alexandria, most likely. They both taught and wrote extensively 
about universal reconciliation, as does much of the Orthodox Church to this day, the Eastern Catholic Church. Now, because America, and to a lesser extent, the West, is isolated, its news is only about itself, uh, there are sometimes news things that will say, around the world in 60 seconds. I will tell you, as somebody who has um, lived in Europe and been a part of that in my life, and listened to Europeans, when they visit America and they hear that around the world in 60 seconds, they're offended. <laughs> because they're thinking, it's the rest of the world. How do you do that? And I've had, I've had people ask me questions, and I'm going, don't ask me. I, I don't know either. By the way, most people in Western European countries and in Asia can name the 50 states and their capitals. And you know, can you name? Of course you can't. So the isolation here is really, you might not know about all of this. That's why we're going to say it today. Gregory of Nyssa, we talked about Clement of Alexandria. Uh, the Orthodox Church is massive. It, is, it, it makes up a huge part of Christians on the planet. And generally, they teach universal reconciliation. You have uh, Diodorus of Tarsus, Theodore of Mopsuestra, John Chrysostom, and there's more than two dozen others. We won't take the time to name. They taught the same. Well, what about the oldest creeds in Christendom? The Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. You ever notice something about them? It's not fair to ask that question, I'm aware. Have you ever noticed something that's not in them? Punishment is not in them. The Apostles' Creed even has Jesus descending into hell, which meant the grave, to teach those there the truth. Why would you do that if after death there was no more chance? There was no reconciliation. Neither of them say a word about punishment. Later creeds were written. Guess what? They don't mention it either. The definition of Chalcedon, the Athanasian Creed, they don't mention it. Because to them, it wasn't a part of the faith that people would be punished and burned forever. The great transition from universal reconciliation to nearly universal punishment, a punishment that goes on for eternity, came after Constantine ordered the church leaders to gather before him and set one never-changing set of doctrines. By the way, they kept changing, and then Christians took up arms against each other for hundreds of years. It was awful. If you've ever wondered how Islam began as a small Arabic nomadic sect and then took over Africa, the Middle East, the Near East, and a lot of, uh, of Europe. If you remember, they ruled Spain for a long time. It was because the Christians were so busy fighting each other, they never fought doctrinally back. They did form armies to fight back, and that was the wrong way to handle things. Uh, the slaughter on both sides is inexcusable. But they would even sometimes, the Christians of North Africa would ally with the Muslims to attack another Christian group. Or the Christians of Asia Minor ally with the Muslims to attack North Africa. It was, and it was all given away. It was all given away. And it started because Rome decided we want to control the church. And the concept of separate government and religion was not a thing. In fact, until America came along, and even in the American Constitution, it only says that the federal government can't set a state religion. Are you aware that for the first many decades of America, there were states that had state religion? Maryland had Catholicism as the state religion. That was not unconstitutional. I think now interpretations would say it is. But back then it wasn't considered that. It just said the federal government can't. But regardless, as Rome gained power... It, if you wanted to be religiously in power, you also had to be politically in power, and they just merged. So the Romans and the religious people that uh, allied themselves to them took control of Alexandria, Asia Minor, 
and the other centers of the church. This is not a quick process. This is a giving back and forth. If you take a look at just the arguments between two huge sections of the church, we're not going to define them. I'm just going to explain this. Arius and Athanasius. Those two bishops and their followers traded power for hundreds of years. And so Christianity was always just in a confused state. The Bishop of Rome, it took a long time for the Bishop of Rome to be recognized as the head of the church and only after they successfully uh, got rid of Constantinople, modern day Istanbul, he then proclaimed himself Pontifex Maximus, claimed superiority over all the church because the government gave him the backing, the swords and the spears to do so. And then force was used to destroy those who disagreed. The emperor Justinian, not Julian, he was an apostate. Justinian, in the 6th century, so it's been going on for 300 years, had heretics. These are not people who who don't believe in God, don't believe in Jesus. These were not Muslims. These were not Hindus, Buddhists. These were Christians who disagreed on some point of doctrine. He had heretics burned alive in front of him as a lesson to those who might consider stepping out of line and called it an act of worship. Because Rome was a center of power, everything not Roman was looked down upon. In fact, the word barbarian merely means outsider. It doesn't mean uncultured, uncivilized, evil. It just means they're not Roman. They're a savage. They're barbarian. Latin became the language. Greek and Hebrew were looked down upon because they were not Roman. Now along comes Augustine, and I'm compressing a few hundred years of history here because I love you. And some of you would like to eat lunch. Along comes Augustine, or Augustine, as he would have been known to his friends, in what is now Algeria, in around 354 A.D. His story is a fascinating one. Suffice it to say, he came from privilege. He lived a very wanton, um, sexually profligate life. Uh, Any pleasure, any pleasure, any pleasure. Then he converted to a version of Christianity, and when it began to be suppressed, he converted to the other form of Christianity. But he refused to learn Greek. Because he was part of the Roman group, the Western church. Latin was the language. He would not listen to his teachers. And it was Augustine who looked at the words for death, the grave, the pit. And then used the word we use, hell. And put that in. He didn't read Greek. He's also the one who didn't read Greek, so he didn't know that ion and the other words for eternal in Scripture don't mean what eternity means to us. That's coming up. Get ready for that lesson. That's going to be in a couple of weeks. We're going to take a look at all of those. He also believed that it was good and proper for pagans to be tortured into accepting his version of Christianity. And he wrote extensively, And he worked politically to make sure it happened. Tortured into accepting Jesus and then the Church of Rome as God's representative on earth. Catholics, we love you. You know your history, so do we. Everybody has awful history. We're not picking on you. We could pick on anybody, couldn't we? But this is talking about how it changed. He taught, Augustine did, Augustine did, that those people had to be lost in a torture pit so that Christians could appreciate what Jesus had done for them. I know that makes no earthly sense at all. But he was the first. Calvin also later on in Protestantism would bring this up as a good point. One of, the, one of the blessings of heaven is that you got to go to a viewing platform to see the souls tortured in hell. That that was part of the pleasures of being in heaven. This is the world they lived in. It was wild, barbaric, and human life meant nothing 
and they considered that from God. The church in Rome systematically excommunicated its early church fathers. They tried to, uh, and some of you believe that they did condemn Origen, who taught universal reconciliation to the systematic theology. If you'll find more recent books on history, you'll find out that the council that condemned him was not legally um, formed and that none of its decisions were binding either in a religious or the secular realm. So, no. But still, the Catholic Church, again, has come back and said that was wrong and uncondemned him. So, good for that. Uh, They also excommunicated other church fathers. They've never brought back in Arius. They've never brought back in some of the others. And yet, still throughout history, and this is the thing you need to know, this thread, this belief in universal reconciliation has not gone away. I didn't even know it existed until a decade or two ago. It has never gone away, though. Uh, George Saris, S-A-R-R-I-S, in his book, uh, op- let's see, his book, Heaven's Doors, very accessible reading, lists some of them. And I get this list from him, so credit goes to him. Eighth century Clement of Ireland. We started with kissing the Blarney Stone. Saint Isaac of Nineveh, who is still one of the top saints. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. My Eastern Orthodox friends, would you tell me how to sharpen that? It just seems he's one of the most quoted saints in the Eastern Church. Saint Isaac of Nineveh. Maximus the Confessor. Confessor. Ninth century, John Scotus Ergena. The 11th century, Albigenses, who were hunted down and killed by armies of the state for not following Rome. 12th century, Abbot Renaud de France. 13th century, Solomon, Bishop of Bassara. The 14th century, Lollards, once again, hunted down and killed for it. In the 15th century, there was a sect called the Men of Understanding. They taught it. So did Twaller of Strasbourg, John Wessel, and Giovanni Pico della Mirandola. Makes my name sound so pedestrian. (laughs) And Martin Luther taught and wrote that people could and would be saved after death if they turned to God. So did the Anabaptist. Listen up here, people. I came from an Anabaptist branch. Nobody told me that when I was in it. <laughs> we were told we were the one true church that got dropped down from heaven in 33 AD, but not quite. We had to skip over about 1,700 years of history to get there. The Anabaptists were the root of the Amish, the Mennonites, disciples of Christ, independent Christian churches, and the Church of Christ. And the Anabaptists taught openly that after death... Christ's grace and God's love still could reach you if you would turn to them. William Law might not mean anything to you. He's the one that taught the Wesley brothers, though, and they're the founders of Methodism, taught this. So did Andrew Jukes, deacon of the Church of England, and one of the most successful missionaries of the 19th century. The only one I know of who had amazing success in China in the 1800s. By the way, the Chinese then sang a song that was the most popular hymn in China until the communists took it over in the 1940s, 1930s. Jesus loves me, this I know. It used to be in hymnals. If you find an old hymnal, it'll even say a little note under favorite hymn of China because that's what it was known as. George MacDonald, who many of you might not know, but he was, he's best known today for writer of fiction, of novels. And he was the mentor. He was the one C.S. Lewis looked up to to learn how to read and write and how to tell stories. George MacDonald's books have never gone out of print. And what is it now, 150 years? George MacDonald's real name was Robin Perry, P-A-R-R-Y. He was an evangelical preacher in Scotland and he wrote an evangelical universalist. And his sermon on that is available online 
It's not a video, people. I know. Anybody younger than 30, I need to explain this to. They didn't have video. They didn't even have a court reporter drawing pictures. You have to read the thing. But it's there. Benjamin Rush, Americans. Does that sound familiar to any of you? He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And a pastor. And he taught universal reconciliation. Eastern Orthodox Church. And listen to this. Even today, thank God, the Roman Catholic Church does not rule out universal salvation. Cardinal Dulles wrote in the Catholic Journal First Things, quote, The fact that something is highly improbable need not prevent us from hoping and praying that, will, that it will happen. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, quote, he's quoting this, In hope, the Church prays for all men to be saved. At another point, the catechism declares, the church prays that no one should be lost. The threads are coming back. The old teachings are coming back. Those of you that are saying, but what about hell? Can you wait? (laughs) Can you wait? And in the meantime, can you be at peace? It's a subject that needs to be tackled head on and with great respect for the scripture. But since our time is limited... Let's just close with a few scriptures to help us get through this next week, shall we? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. 1 Timothy, is that where I want to be? Yeah. This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind the man Christ Jesus, who has given himself as a ransom for all people. And this has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And I'm getting to the point where I have pages falling out of my Bible, but I still read them. <laughs> um, we're not taking them out. And First John chapter 2, can you bring that one up? Because um, my page is sticking. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then 1 John 4, 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be Savior of the world. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Those pages are still not sticking. Verses 9 through 11. This is a trustworthy saying that, f- that deserves full acceptance. This is why we strive, labor and strive, because we put our hope in the living God who is, who not who might be, could be, possibly, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. What an interesting phrase. Command and teach these things. And then last for today, Romans 5 And verse 18, it's one of those things, once you start looking, you start seeing it everywhere. Consequently, just as one trespass trespass, resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. While we wrestle with what we've been taught, while we struggle to see what is right, what is true, while we like the Bereans study the scriptures daily, be at peace because these other scriptures are in there too. I could have read, by my count, and I'm sure I've missed some, 73 verses, passages today. But these four will stand in for it today. God loves you. You, um, There is punishment, and you don't want that. You want to come to Christ now. There is no purgatory for you to pay for your sins. You can't do that. The punishment's something different. And those of us who are Christians, whether you received Christ as a child or whether you come to him on your deathbed, there's not punishment. You're just welcomed home. That's why we want you to do that now. We want you to come to Christ.